Professor Taylor, Dr. John Blackson. <laughs> <laughs> he went for a drink. <laughs> uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. Uh, could I just note, I have a, a little bit of Bell's palsy, which is a temporary condition, will go away in a few months, but for the rest of my introductory remarks, I'm going to hold my uh, cheek. It makes it easier for you to understand me. First, could I implore the SDSC and Professor Taylor to look to others upon which to reflect in future years? <laughs> <laughs> I will be uh, tending my garden somewhere one day. Uh, today, however, I really want to focus on what I think is a very, very important addition to the analysis and understanding of our experience in the East Timor operation. John has compiled an exceptional narrative and insightful reflection in East Timor intervention, a retrospective on Interfet. He's drawn from key participants across the political, military, strategic and academic spectrum to give us a considered retrospective on Interfet International Force East Timor, the largest Australian military contribution, indeed the lead contribution, since the end of the Vietnam War in 1975. The story of East Timor, or Timor-Leste, as we now know it, is a personal story, not only for John, but who was an intelligence officer in our army at the time, but also for many other members of the Australian Army, including myself. As a Lieutenant Colonel, I did deploy to East Timor uh, for about seven months across 2001-2002 as the commanding officer of the 2nd Battalion Group uh, into the border area. We were a component of the United Nations Transitional Administration East Timor, UNTE, charged with maintaining law and order uh, while interim civil administration was established in the lead up to Timorese independence in May of 2002. Now my service came uh, towards the middle of the Australian peacekeeping mission in Timor, which was in fact a series of progressive military commitments styled by a range of factors, including and particularly the political and strategic concerns, humanitarian interests and regional stability. As the contributors to John's book very articulately capture, at the time of Interfair, Timor was all about political military and strategic timing. As the soldiers of our Special Air Service Regiments and uh, the 2nd Battalion on its first rotation stepped off RAAF C-130s into Dili in September 1999, their weapons were at the ready. We had tenuous agreements with our partners uh, in the Indonesian Army, the TNI, that they would pull back to West Timor when we arrived in East Timor. We didn't have a clear picture of what we were walking into, we, those who deployed. Those initial stages were extremely tense, uncertain, unclear, typical of the initiation of any operational activity. With Australian and Indonesian forces patrolling the streets, and I have to say junior leadership on both sides making the difference and being ultimately the wellspring of success. Now the scale of destruction and systematic violence, not only within Dili but in the regional towns closer to the border, was significant. The lack of habitation in those areas combined with the level of damage was eerie. Rumours of human rights abuses and mass executions by militias were right. Ultimately, law and order was restored, both by the good faith and hard work of Indonesia and its people and troops, and also by a coalition of 22 willing nations that had, hit, hit, uh, that had hitherto uh, not worked together. We also had the opportunity to rekindle a long-standing relationship with the New Zealand Defence Force who readily contributed a talent to the operation. From an army perspective, Timor not only tested how prepared our army was to conduct operations, it taught us valuable lessons 
on how to lead a coalition and also how to orchestrate a campaign. Lessons that are extraordinarily important to the Army, the ADF and the nation today and into its future. From 1975, with the end of the Vietnam War, to Team War in 1999, we were in what I reflect very positively upon, a sustained but also managed period, extended period of peace, with some peacekeeping operations uh, at long distance from Australia. We trained in our Defence Force for uh, various strategic settings, most particularly continental defence at that time. Our numbers decreased and our equipment did age. As the commanding officer of 2RAR, when I first arrived and looked upon the battalion, I reflected on what might have been a similar experience now today it would be 100 years ago during the August offensive of uh, the, uh, the First World War. And thinking of the success of those early battalions in the first AIF. And I realised I was looking at a battalion that was smaller in number, had a fewer number of weapon systems, had fewer numbers of each of those weapon systems. And each of those weapon systems firing a lesser weight of fire with an ammunition first uh, allocation of a smaller amount. Of course, the context is all. We had helicopters, armoured personnel carriers, night vision devices, and most particularly training that our first AOF had never experienced. But Timor did highlight how fragile our expeditionary and logistic capabilities were. Essentially, we were tested in our fitness to fight and to sustain uh, an operation. But Timor also taught us about resilience and a willingness to do a tough job in challenging circumstances and in an uncertain setting, both politically and socially. A circumstance that we have uh, encountered now uh, on num uh, numerous occasions since then. It was the beginning, as you know, of 16 years of almost continuous operational commitment by our Defence Force through the Solomons, Iraq and Afghanistan. Enforcement, peacekeeping, combat operations, mentoring, reconstruction and training, the full spectrum of tasks. This book tells us just how quickly a nation's strategic circumstances can the readiness of the ADF for expeditionary operations, as I say, was tested. <laughs> Including, <clears throat> in particular, uh, the test of leadership. And that test was, I, I believe, very successfully uh, uh, passed by the quality of our people across the very wide range and spectrum of organisations and interests engaged in this operation. Now the strength of John's book for me lies in how he has knitted together four key themes, the geopolitical precursors to the 1999 intervention in West Timor, the rapidly deployed military-led restoration of security, international views of the intervention, and finally the national strategic, political and tactical reflections for both East Timor and the coalition nations that came to its aid. We were lucky, but as I think uh, Peter Credlin has recently made famous, it was the luck of very hard work. Quite rightly, we should reflect and appreciate the at least 30 years of very diligent diplomatic effort to engage with our partner Indonesia and to build pathways of communication and understanding, dialogue and engagement. We saw in the preceding 12 months a recognition that the situation was fundamentally changing. And I will name some names, but I know that there were many involved. Here I would acknowledge the foresight of Admiral Barry in changing the preparedness settings 
of the Defence Force well early of intervention. I'd also recognise Hugh White and uh, the Strategic Policy Coordination Group of Mandarins across the core elements of the security agencies in uh, the government setting that were preparing the policy and appreciating and advising government on where we were going. That evolved in time to see uh, Prime Minister Director East Timor Policy Group under Alan Taylor emerge. It was, uh, we can look back and say, a next opportunity to build the whole of government experience. Much matured now, but an important step. I know our attaches and our senior diplomats in Indonesia were extraordinarily active both on the ground in uh, East Timor, Dili, and also Jakarta. We had planning the future beyond Interfed, people like Mike Smith engaging with the UN on what comes next and how does it work. Paul Simon was there with uh, monitors in the pre-intervention phase, undertaking some extraordinarily important but quite precarious work. Our international policy team and strategic operations division were building a coalition we had not done before. And that's, we had not done it for decades and decades. And of course, General Cosgrove and his colleagues, the senior leadership of all of those intervening partners, were working to remain aligned and to lead a force and to work with Indonesia to achieve success. I acknowledge the Prime Minister today, John Howard, and the National Security Committee of the Cabinet, who ultimately must be the navigators and the decision makers for this kind of operation. Again, like coalition building, something that was new to all involved. And I do reflect on the soldiers, sailors, airmen and women, and the diplomats, and the uh, UN officials on the ground at different stages who were making the personal contribution and the difference. Now I've mentioned many parts of a very, very comprehensive effort by this nation and others. I don't want to suggest at any point that we didn't experience what the Chicago School of Economics, famous for its Nobel Prizes, described as creative tension. There was plenty of that. And so there should be in something that is so important and something that we should be reflecting on and recognising. Luck did absolutely play a part and in this I would note the luck of the geography. That East Timor wasn't too far away, both for logistic and telecommunication reasons. It was, if you like, in a sweet spot for what the ADF and our collective national effort could achieve. And it is uh, insightful and gives great confidence that our leaders of that time across the national community could understand what we could achieve if we did it together. And for that reason, I would commend to you this book by John Blackson. It's offers much from which we can learn and continue to gain value in the current and future operations, not just of our Defence Force, but of the team that you now see deployed on any operation that Australia engages in the, in the world. Uh, so ladies and gentlemen, uh, to Dr John Blackman and the team of SDSC and those contributors to the conference, uh, uh, and uh, indeed Marcus Fielding and uh, the MHHV. Uh, thank you for putting together this very, very worthy uh, piece of work and for bringing together those who live the experience and can offer that first hand insight into what I think was and will continue to be seen as a pivotal point in the development of the profession of national security uh, in this nation. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.